I'm going to invite you to continue standing as we read two passages of Scripture. They're not very long, but as I've shared with you before, I want you to open your Bibles. If you were here on Thursday's Bible study, I shared with you the importance of having your physical Bible. Many people cannot remember Scripture, and it's because they, work, they rely on these electronic things. And it's already been proven that you don't absorb the same way electronically as you do with the physical, that tangible nature of flipping that page and seeing it in relationship to the book makes something stick in your brain. And so I invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. We're going to read just a few verses here verses 23 through 25, and then we're going to turn to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. But here in Luke chapter 9, verses 22 through 25, the, 23 through 25, the Word of God reads, And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall find it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? Turn to Galatians chapter 2 companion scripture spoken from a slightly different vantage point but saying the same thing Paul notes in verse 20 I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his precious word in Jesus' name. I'd like to use for a thought this morning, dying to live. Dying to live. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Dying to live. In today's message title, I'm employing the use of an oxymoron or a paradoxical statement to convey an important spiritual truth. An oxymoron is a self-contradicting word or group of words, like a loving enemy. Those two words don't really belong together, loving and enemy. It's an oxymoron. Or a hateful friend. Those words don't belong together because friends shouldn't be hateful. Now, paradox is a statement or an argument that seems to be contradictory or to go against common sense. But yet, perhaps it is still true. For example, less is more. How can less be more? But we know sometimes less can actually be more. Or as in my sermon title, Dying to live, literally dying to oneself so that one can live. So are you dying today to live? I sang for you that great prayer of St. Francis of Assisi to get at the last part of that phrase. I'm just going to repeat the last stanza or what we sang is the first stanza. It's actually the last stanza of his prayer. Which is for it is giving that we receive. That's a paradox right there, too. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It's by giving something to somebody else that we get what we want. And then he says, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. This morning, God wants to reason with us, He wants to speak into our minds with the goal of reaching down into our hearts. Church is not a place for just emotion. It's not a place to just feel good. 
It's a place where God can get into your heart. Where he can help you discover who and what you really are. You are an eternal being that will spend eternity somewhere. And God wants to awaken your consciousness to this truth. Why do we come to church? Why? Why are we here? Why? What is our true motivation? Why did we decide today I'm going to go to church? Why is it that any day we decide today I'm going to go to church? What is it that's really motivating you and motivating me? What's driving us to do this thing called church? Who do we really want to worship? Who? Do you really want to worship God? Or are we really worshiping ourselves? Do we come to church so God will bless our agenda? So he will do for us what we want him to do? Or do we come to church because we need to know God? We need a connection with the divine. We need an assurance that he is really there. Ah, that he is alive and that he is real. In our passage from the Gospel of Luke, Jesus made it clear. We must take up our cross that is die to ourselves, and he adds, unlike the other Gospels, we must do this daily. We have to determine that every day we are willing to die to the things that we really want, to the things that we really desire, the things that motivate us for things that give us gratitude, to give us gratification and make us feel important. We have to die to that every day and take upon us the cross of Christ. When we do this, We are living out this great paradox of dying so that we can live for him. Jesus declared in that same passage what I refer to as the great paradox of life. I want you to say that. The great paradox of life. This is a great truth about life that God has placed us in down here. When God said, let there be light, when he established uh, the whole creation, this paradox was in his mind and was in his heart. Hallelujah. Many of us fail to see that this is what this life is all about. It's about embracing this paradox that if we seek to save our lives, If we seek to do the things we want to do, the way we want it done, regardless of what Jesus Christ has revealed to us as the Father's will, if we choose to go down that that path, we will be lost. That's the whole purpose of life. Everything you go through, everything I go through, is for us to come to this realization. When we try to do it ourselves, it falls apart. How many know that's true? Anytime you exalt what you feel, what you think above what is written in this word, you lose. For the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. His word will stand forever. 
not what you think or I think. How many of us know that there was a time when if you were sick, people would cut your veins and bleed you? How many of us know that's true? That's what people used to do. Did you all know that? That's what people used to do. That was the prevailing wisdom of medicine, that the disease was in your blood. So if we cut your wrist and let some of the blood out, the disease goes out of your body. Guess what that actually did? It killed people. It's reported that that's how literally George Washington lost his life. They bled him to death when he was sick. Just because you think it's true doesn't make it so. It is written that every man's ways are pure in his own eyes. We have the ability to self-justify, but it's God who holds the secrets of life. So, so when we seek to do things our way, the way we want to do them, regardless, regardless, now hear me, regardless of what Jesus Christ says and what he has taught us, then we lose. How did I end up here? As I was praying for our church and praying for you, the Lord said, my people are getting too close to the world. Just like when I brought them out of Egypt into the promised land, I told them, when you get into that promised land, do not, do not take upon you the ways of the people in the land. Because for this reason, I am spewing them out. And if you follow their ways, I will spew you out too. You're getting too close. You're getting too close because it makes sense to you. Hey. But just because it makes sense to you uh, doesn't mean it's right. you got to lose your life <laughs> if you want to fire it. Are you dying to live? None of us can make heaven on our own terms. It just won't happen. You, 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 you may pray all day long, Lord, I want to make it. <laughs> but if you're doing it by your own terms, by your own thoughts, it's not going to work. It's, it's futile. It's foolishness. It's insanity. Mm, when God has already told us that it is only in losing your life for his sake and for the gospel's sake that you can find your lives. But, 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 here's the beautiful thing. If we lose our lives for Christ's sake um, and for the gospel's sake, then we shall Shall save our lives. This is that great paradox again. Yes, if you seek to save your life, you lose it. But when you determine, I'm going to give it all up for the cause of Christ, then God says, I'm going to give it right back. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, you just hold on to that for a little bit because we're going to talk a little bit about that. But see, true life, that is eternal life, can only be found when we are willing to die to ourselves. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, are you dying to live? Why embrace Christianity only to be lost because of rebellion and stubbornness? These two are a deadly combination, and I submit to you today that many of us are caught up in rebellion against God. We know what the Bible says. We know what God has said, but we don't want to believe it that way. And so we hold on to ourselves, and therefore we're leading ourselves to destruction. Rebellion. Stubbornness. Stubbornness is to take a position and to hold to that position no matter what the Bible says. Because I don't want to believe it that way. Hear what the Word of God says. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 15. And I want you to look at two verses of Scripture. Verses 22 and 23. 1 Samuel. Old Testament. Chapter 15, because you need to see this in your Bible. You need to know that your pastor is preaching what God has given him to you so that you can recover yourself out of the snare because I submit some of you are rebellious. I didn't call you a devil. I'm not saying you're out there living like, you know, you don't know God. Hallelujah. But, you know, you can be rebellious and be in the church. Do you know you can be rebellious and be sitting here clapping your hands and patting your feet? Uh, because rebellion is a spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And stubbornness. 
to where you won't move because you don't want to move. You don't want to. I don't want to do it that way. I don't want to submit to that. I don't want that. That's stubbornness. Oh, and there was a king by the name of Saul who got caught up in this. So in 1 Samuel chapter 15, uh, here's what the scripture says. And Samuel said, uh, Samuel was a prophet of God. And he said, half the Lord has great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Mm, what he was making reference to is that God through Samuel had told Saul to go and to actually wipe out a whole race of people called the Amalekites. He said, kill everything, man, woman, children, kill every goat, sheep, ox, horse, whatever you find that's breathing, kill it. I don't want any of it to live because it's so wicked. I want it all destroyed. Mm, but Saul, when he got down there, had people speaking into his ear. How many of y'all have advisors who don't know the book, who don't know the word? Your friends tell you it's okay, but they're not in the book, so they don't really know. And so these people that he should have been leading were leading him by the counsel that they gave. And they said, let's spare the good sheep and the good oxen so we can sacrifice them to God. That sounds like a pretty good plan. The good stuff we're going to sacrifice because God likes sacrifice. But do you not know this? That many times what the people sacrifice, they got to eat. So the sacrifice had nothing to do really with honoring God. They were lustful. And they wanted the good food to eat. But they sanctified it. Some of us have what I call sanctified sin. It's sin, but we sanctify it. We justify it. We make it okay because I don't believe God's going to hurt me because of that. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, are you dying to live? Oh. So Samuel says, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. What God really wants from you is obedience. And to hearken, that word means to hear. To hear then than the fat of rams. What God really wants out of you is your obedience to his word. He's not asking you to sacrifice nothing. He's not asking you to do what you think makes sense. And I ask so you can heap it upon your lust. He wants you just to do what he says. And turn to your neighbor and say, just do what God said. That's all he wants is what you to do what he said. Look at verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So the question is, what's witchcraft? Witchcraft is a spell regarding a false understanding of current and future events. Witchcraft... It's designed to cause you to think uh, that something is true that's not really true. Uh, and that your future holds something that is not really true. It's like divination. Uh, hallelujah. To try to foretell what's going to happen. Uh, and so rebellion for us is like witchcraft. We get it in our head. It's okay. Uh, it's all right to do this. Uh, we let our minds get absorbed uh, in this untruth as if it's true. Uh, it's witchcraft. And that's what rebellion is. When you rebel against the word of God, you practice witchcraft. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, that's a sobering thought. Right now it's not jump and shout time. It's God blowing through to purge his people of impurity. How many want to be holy? How many want to be righteous and pure? How many want to be like the angels in heaven when they see the God's goodness and they cry, holy, 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 and they cry holy without guilt and without condemnation? How many don't feel condemned in your soul because you know you're living right and you can shout holy? This is where God wants you to be. Because rebellion, that spirit, 
that causes you to say, I don't need to obey the pastor. And you all know me well enough. Hallelujah. I feel the need to caveat because uh, I'm not preaching to put myself on a pedestal. I'm not. Uh, But God has been speaking to me saying, but my people need to know that when they rebel against you, they're rebelling against me, especially when I'm fasting and praying and asking God to order every word that comes out of my mouth because I recognize I got to give an account for everything I say to you, everything I say. God's going to hold me accountable for it uh, and I will be judged uh, by every word that comes out of my mouth. Uh, So this pastor uh, is real careful uh, about what comes out of his mouth uh, because if I say something to you, I could be condemning myself. So Lord said, I want my people to know. See, they look at you as just a man. I am. I'm a man. But when I stand here, I am God's representative to you. And you need to hear what the Spirit is saying unto the church. God wants you sanctified. He wants you holy, not rebellious. That means you got to stay in the book. You got to know what's in here, saints. That's the only way you're going to know if what I'm telling you is right or not. In any church, that's the only way you're going to know. you got to stay in the book. So rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Iniquity is a a gross word, a, a plural word for sin. When you say I'm just a stubborn person, you're saying I'm sinful. Because stubbornness causes you not to truly think about facts. When you're stubborn, you get set in what you believe because it's what you believe. I'm convicted about the word of God, but I'm not stubborn. I allow anybody in this congregation at any time to call me into question on anything I say. Because guess what? Pastor just might be wrong. How about that for a novel thought? Your pastor can be wrong. But if I'm walking in the spirit, probability is I won't be. But I have to see, I have to leave myself open for that possibility so I won't be stubborn. Do you hear me? Do you hear the Lord? Stubbornness is as iniquity, gross sin, and idolatry. What's idolatry? Worshiping something other than God. (laughs) Buckle up because here it comes. When you worship what you think and what you feel above what God says, you're an idolater. Yes, that's what you are. You're worshiping you. Preach, I don't say it that way. But you got no Bible to back up what you believe. Woo! I feel good. Why do I feel good? Because the word is right. It's true. It's true. Some of us never had true fathers. Raise your hand if you think you had a true father. Raise it. I want to see it. Not every hand is up. A true father will never let us see his child go off and not say something. And today, your heavenly father is crying out to you, don't be stubborn. Don't get so set and what you're going to do and what you're not going to do to where you can't hear God. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. The last verse, how do we know what's really causing this? He tells us. Remember I told you you got to know this. 
because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected thee, he said to Saul, from being king. When we reject the word, we reject God. No if, hands, or buts. I don't want you to just... I mean, I'm doing that too, right? You all see me up here praising him? Does pastor praise the Lord? But it's more than that. Because when we finish all the gyrations, we got to be walking in this. Oh, it's vanity. 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. I'm worthless. Yes, just making noise. In Galatians chapter 2, our second passage. Paul actually elaborates on the great paradox of life. From his words, it is clear that all true Christians, I underscore the word true, all true Christians must experience this paradox. If you're in here right now and you call yourself a Christian, you must be able to say, I'm living that paradox. What's that paradox? That paradox is that we are crucified with Christ. What's crucifixion? It's death. It's death. We are crucified with Christ. We allow ourselves to die just as Christ died. We're crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, the scripture says, we live. But what's really causing us to live is not our own selves, our own will. We live because we're living by the faith of the Son of God. It is Christ living within us. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, let Christ live in you. He wants to live in you now. He wants to rule in you. Christ doesn't live any place, uh, dwell any place where he doesn't have control, where he doesn't have dominion, where he doesn't have authority. How many want Christ living inside of you? You got to have that. And this is our expectation that when we let Christ live inside of us, then that mystery, remember I told you from the very beginning, when God said, let there be light, he had the paradox of life in mind. It's only by you dying that you can come to life. And so Paul says that when we are crucified with Christ and Christ is living in us, then this mystery that has been hid from the ages is revealed. What's the mystery? What's the knowledge that most people don't know? When you're not in the church, you don't get this. You don't understand. This is what God is actually doing. What he's trying to do. What's this mystery? that's been hid from the beginning. The mystery is Christ in you. Hallelujah. How many want Christ inside of you? Christ in you. The hope of glory. The hope of glory. The hope of glory. If you want to make it into heaven, you got to have Christ on the inside of you. And the only way Christ can get down inside of you is you got to relinquish control. you got to let go of your will. you got to die to yourself. you got to die so you can live. If you want Christ to step inside of you and begin to live in you, to talk in you, and to walk in you. How many love it when God speaks to your mind, share something with you that you know only God knew. How do you feel? You feel like you can walk on the moon as it were, because God is speaking to me. How many want to be at that point to where you can say what the hymn said? He walked walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me, I, I, I am his own. How many want to be owned by God? God wants to come inside of you. He wants to be the hope of glory. He wants you to die and so you can live. He wants to show you what life is really all about. You don't need to fear embracing this paradox. I encourage you today, just embrace it. Say, I'm going to die 
die so I can live. Tell your neighbor again, I'm going to die so I can live. I want to be what Christ wants me to be. I want to go where Jesus Christ is. What God said, come unto me. Come, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. But you got to come. And to come to Christ, you got to die to who you are. You have to say, Lord, I don't know nothing. When you come to God, you got to claim spiritual bankruptcy. What's bankruptcy? Bankruptcy is when you got nothing in the bank, nothing there. Some of us need to claim spiritual bankruptcy. Because when you claim bankruptcy in the natural, the courts give you forgiveness of your debt. And God today wants to forgive you of all your debt. But you got to come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm dying to live. See, that has a double meaning. I'm dying to myself so that I can live again. But when we really want to do something, we say, I'm dying to do this. I can't wait to do this. So are you dying to live? Are you dying to feel the joy of the Holy Ghost within you? When you give up, give up, give up give up let go let go let go let go of you let go let go are you willing to stand on your feet I'm not saying now but you can do it if you feel it are you willing to stand on your feet even if other people aren't and to wave your hand and say Jesus take me take me I'm yours we sang a song and sometimes sing I'm yours Lord everything I am everything I've got everything I'm not I'm yours Lord try me now try me now and see see if I can be completely yours Lord can I die to me can I get to the point to where I get on my throne I get on my knees and I say Lord there's no good thing in me how many know in you in your flesh there's no good thing God nothing in me worth redeeming I'm a mess and I'm messed up my mind's messed up my heart's messed up my soul's messed up relative to what it should be I need more of you I just want more of you I just want more I just want more I just want more and you stay there and say Lord I need more of you I need more of the spirit. What are you doing? You're dying. You're dying to your will. Lord, I don't know what to do. All I know is it says, this poor man cried. And the Lord heard him and saved him and delivered him out of all his trouble. How many want God to save you? Immediately, immediately, immediately. But David, you got to let it go. There are times in my spiritual walk what are some things I like to do? Let me just tell you one. And I'm not saying this is true for everybody. But I just want you to understand this. I'm going to use this one. Because back in this day, this is what we as brothers did and didn't do. I used to have leg pride. That's what you're talking about. See, when I was a teenager, back in my era in the 70s, when we wore shorts, the shorts we wore, they came up to here. How many remember that? If you're young, see, you don't remember that, even though it's coming back now. Watch these basketball players. You know what they're pulling the, they're pulling the pants up? They were up here. That meant, I don't want to defame my communion table, but that meant all of this was showing. And I was in the park with my pants on. I had a lot less this, and these had gone out. (laughs) Do you get my drift? And these were pretty muscular. And the girls came up and said, who's that? You got pretty legs. Hear me now, hear me now. You got pretty legs. Ooh, we like your legs. So guess what I started doing? 
I always start wearing shorts. Why? Because I wanted to hear the women say, you got pretty legs. I began to worship my legs. Some of you are worshiping what you think people like in you. Buckle up, because I'm coming real close with what God did to me. So I loved having my legs out. So Lord saved me one day, and I was still having my legs out. In fact, I got to work on a bike in Michigan. I got to work on a bike. So to me, it's justifiable. I'm riding a bike. I need to have my legs out because I don't want to get my pants leg caught in the bike. See, I had a reason for it. And I went, and the Lord said, cover them legs up, boy. I don't want people staring at your legs. I want them staring at my spirit in you. Ow! Joe, I don't care if your legs are pretty. If people are looking at your pretty legs, they're not seeing me. And I'm supposed to be the one that they see, not your pretty legs. So I got an answer. There's ways of pureness on eyes. I got an answer. I went and got some Bermuda shorts. A little bit longer. Down to the knee. But see, they can still see my big calves. Got my Bermuda shorts. I got the answer. Got on my bike, riding home with my Bermuda shirt, and I said, what you doing, Joe? Take them back. <laughs> no, Lord. They're not showing nothing. Bermuda shirt. Take them back, Joe. Put some pants on, boy. Put some pants on. And so I took them back. But I was real upset. <laughs> Why am I sharing this with you? Did God care about my pretty legs? Did God want to keep me from wearing shorts? What God was after was my heart. He wanted the pride out of there. He can't abide where there's pride. Just in case you think I'm off the book, let's talk about Abraham and Isaac. God said to Abraham, go to Moriah and sacrifice Isaac. Die to what you really want. Isaac was his son of promise. What do you mean kill Isaac? He's the one to whom the seed is going to come. Yeah, kill your blessing in that right there. Kill it, kill it, kill it. The thing you want, I want you to give it to me. And Abraham didn't say, no, God, that, that's the devil. That ain't you. That's, that's just legalism. Woo! I feel the Holy Ghost all over me because I hear your spirit and so does the Lord. That's not legalism. That's God talking to you. See, it doesn't have to be written, thou shalt not. They that are led by the... Oh! That means if the spirit starts telling you and it's not in the book, you still got to do it. Are you shouting with me? So God said to Abraham, sacrifice him. Kill him. The very child you've been waiting for. You're 99 years old, 100 years old. You've been waiting for this child for 25 years. Kill it. Okay, Holy Ghost. Well, see, there was nothing wrong with my Bermuda shirts. Lord, they even match my top. I was coordinated. I thought fashion-wise that, that made a lot of sense. Am I talking to you now? See, I've been where you are. You see me the way, Sister Hernandez testified, see, you see me the way I am, but you don't recognize I was young too. You don't recognize I got saved when I was 20 with an interior design background. I know fashion. I know it. I know it. I can actually take you into history and tell you about it. I knew what I was doing, and I knew what I was doing looked good. Sidebar. When I was that age, though, I was poor. So my wife called me JoJo. You know why my wife called me JoJo? Who knows why my wife called me JoJo? I know you don't know. Maybe Michael knows. My wife calls me JoJo. 
Because my wife used to have a clown on her desk in her dorm. And the clown had a lot of different colors on. It wasn't very coordinated. And so she named her clown Jojo. He's dressed like you. I said, Lady Black is rough. Well, she can be. <laughs> but she's loving. She was truthful. One thing, my wife is truthful. She said, you look like JoJo. <laughs> but see, I was poor. How many here know it's like to be poor? How many know you, when you're poor, you can't pick what, pick what you get? You better get it and be thankful. So I wore a bunch of hand-me-downs. Yes, this brother wore hand-me-downs. See, y'all don't know you see me now. I can put it together, can I? I can put it together, but there was a day I didn't have it. Whatever I had. Lord, my shorts coordinate. And God said, I don't care. Sacrifice it. Just like he said to Abraham, take your son, kill him. Did God want him to kill Isaac, absolutely not. But what was God looking for? God wanted to know, do you love me more than your son? God wanted to know for me, do you love me more than your shorts? Sisters, do you love God more than your pants? Brothers, do you love him more than your shoes? Do you love him more than your bracelets? Do you love them more than all of those things you have on that bring attention to you? Hear me now. See, this is strong meat. This is strong meat. God wants you to go beyond what's convenient for you, what makes sense to you. And he wants you to do what he wants you to do. And many of us know it. We know it. But we're resisting. Why? Because we're rebellious. And God wants to root that out of us. I got a message next week. It's on sanctification. But God said, you got to deal with this first. You got to deal with this first. You got to get my people to the point to where they will break up the fallow ground of the heart. To where you will examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. Stop looking for, is it in the Bible? Does the Bible say I can't do it? Hear me, hear me. And young people, y'all need to really hear me because this is normally a vanity of youth. Well, if the Bible says I don't, if it's not in the Bible, then I should be able to do it. That's not the way a child of God thinks. Because remember, the Lord said, I'm going to give you the Spirit. And the Spirit is going to lead you and guide you into all truth. That means it may not be in here, but for you it's truth. Because, see, somebody else maybe didn't have... Short pride. They can wear the shorts and there ain't, ain't an issue. I couldn't. You know, like I know, what creates pride in your heart. And God wants to purge you of that. So we want to embrace this paradox. We want to die so we can live. How many of us here, Romans chapter 12, uh, when it tells us to present our bodies, uh, what kind of sacrifice? Uh, a living sacrifice, uh, holy and what? Uh, acceptable unto who? God, which is your what? Uh, reasonable service. That's your reasonable service. God not asking a lot out of you to ask you to obey. It's your reasonable service. Hallelujah. How many know that same example that I use for Abraham? Hallelujah. I know some of you are feeling a little beat up right now. I can feel it in your spirit. But that's okay. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. That's an oxymoron again. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. But if you have a friend, he's going to tell you the truth. Because it's going to help you out. So that same story about Abraham and Isaac. When Abraham said, okay, Lord, I'm going to kill him. He got his son. His son said, Daddy, I see the wood. I see the fire. Where's the sacrifice? Abraham said, the Lord will prepare.
prepare himself a sacrifice. He didn't tell the son, brother, you it. Hallelujah. But he knew he was when his daddy started binding his hands and binding his feet and put him on the wood to kill him. And Isaac wasn't eight or nine. He was probably 18 or 19. Oh, Lord. How many of us, we get 18 and 19. We can't obey our parents anymore because we're 18 and 19. If you would have been Isaac, you'd be dead. So he bound him up. He put him on the altar. He got the knife. He's about to cut his throat. And God said, whoa, stop. Hold the press. That's not what I'm after. What I want is to know that you love me enough to give it all up. How many today say I love God enough to give it all up? Lord, I give myself away. I give myself away. I give it away to you, Lord. And so God said, I now I know that you love me. How many want God to know that you love him? How many really want to know that? How many want to feel that? The only way you're going to feel that is that you got to let go of the thing you're holding on to so tight because you think you're going to lose it if you give it up. You think it's not going to come back if you give it up. But I'm telling you, God's just testing you because the God I serve, he wants to, he blessings on you. He wants to bless you abundantly. He wanted to give me more than short pants. He gave me a BMW. I'll take that any day over some shorts. Well, watch out, preacher, because I can come a lot closer. He gave me a house on a hill, too, with a little bit of land. Hallelujah. Glory to God, because I just gave it up. I don't care what it was. I said, take it, Lord. If you want it, it's yours. Lord, if you want my robe, It's yours, Lord. Take it. Strip me down. Get me down. If you want my shoes, Lord. Here. Take my shoes. I don't care. You want my socks too? Take my socks. I won't take my shirt off. But oh Lord, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. And God said, yeah, I like that. Keep going, Joe. Okay. What do you want, Lord? You want my girlfriend? I'll give my girlfriend away. You want me to be a eunuch? I'll be a eunuch. I thought I would be a eunuch. I thought I would never get married. I wouldn't have these two beautiful children on the front. Lord, if you want me to the point where I can't marry nobody, I'm yours. Lady, Lady Black, am I speaking the truth? She first told me, get lost. She did. We weren't saved. I was dancing with her, staring her in the eyes. And she looked at me and said, can't you find someone else? <laughs> I preach truth. I said, oh, wow. So guess what I did? I left her alone. Oh, Jesus. See, some of you all, you're so afraid you're not going to get it till you keep holding on to it. God said, let it go. You said, I can't, I can't. Let that boy go. I can't, I can't. Let that girl go. I can't, I can't. If I let her go, I might lose her. I'm telling you, if you don't let her go, you never had her. So I let her go. See, then God started working on her. She realized I was a pretty good catch. I may have looked like JoJo back then, but JoJo had some brain brain. You chew on that a little bit. Joe know how to make some money money. But I didn't have that when she married me. So she didn't marry me because of my money. She married me because of my legs. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but see, I start getting as close to God as I can get. And my pastor began to ask me to take my wife to her job. I wasn't trying to do that. He was asked because she didn't have a car. 
He said, take Leslie here. Take Leslie there. Like, Pastor, why are you doing that? Because he knew. He knew what God had intended. And so we started spending more time together because the pastor let that door open. See, I didn't try to make it happen. I wasn't snuggling up on her bed. We were, in, we were on the dorm. I wasn't snuggling up on her bed next to her. We're both saved. So we, can, we, we, we know how to handle ourselves. I'm flesh and blood. Brothers, how many brothers are flesh and blood? Tell the truth. When you see a woman and she looks good, you don't want to just stand next to her. Am I preaching or am I preaching? So stop playing that game. You're just playing with fire. The Bible says, can a man put fire in his bosom and not get burned? You're going to get burned. And nothing wrong waiting until the time is right. So we waited till the time is right. And now we got a relationship that most of y'all will never have. And I'm not bragging or boasting, but my wife and I, we're like two peas in a pod. Because God gave her to me in his time. And he gave me to her in his time. See, Abraham, God said, slay Isaac. Kill him. And Abraham didn't say, no, God, I don't understand that. That ain't you. That must be the devil. He said, okay, Lord, I'll kill him. And he was just about to kill him. God said, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm Jehovah Jireh. But let me tell you what he said to him. I want you to hear this. Genesis chapter 22. Here's what God said to him, verse 16. And he said, this is God now. By myself I have sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and has not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars are of under the heaven. God said, will you give it to me? Will you give it up? I'm going to bless you. Why do you come to church? God's objective, Brother Kissy, is to bless you. He's not looking to curse you. He's not trying to make you feel bad. He's not asking you to look like a homeless bum. But he does want you holy. In all manner of conversation. Conversation there means lifestyle. From the crown of your head to the base of your feet. And God is going to send his word to sanctify you. You come to God as you are, but you don't stay that way. God receives everybody just for who they are. But this word, the Bible says, is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God's going to send his word to find out what's going on down in your heart. And he's going to sanctify you from the inside out. In blessing, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply you. And because you've obeyed my voice, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed through you. Saints of God, many of you on here are blessed now because I obeyed. You're, you're drinking, you're absorbing the residue of my obedience. I'm not putting pastor on a pedestal. This is just fact. In blessing, I will bless, you know, bless thee, and I'll make all nations a blessing because of you. Because they associate with you, I'm going to do something for them. Because you know how to obey. And what did he say to Joshua and to Abraham? I know you're going to command your house to obey too. My children are here. I don't take any credit for that. God got a hold of them. But when they were in my house, I told them about Jesus. And I didn't beat him over the head. You better come to, did I ever do this, Michael? Did you? you better come to church. You better wear this. You better wear that. Did, bah, 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 bah. did I nag, beat, nag, beat, nag? Not near one time. You know what I did? I just lived it. Just live it. If you live it, they'll see it. They'll know what to follow. 
You, don't have, you really don't have to say a word. Although Deuteronomy 6 says, talk to them when they get up, when you go by the wayside, when you're doing this, and when they lay down at night. You talk to them. In the car, in there, Danielle, morning's taking you to school. We had some good conversations, didn't we? Saints of God, are we dying to live? Are we willing to say, God, I don't know it all, and that's okay, but I want to live for you. Stand up. I went much longer than I planned, but God knows. Jesus told his disciples this. There is no man that hath left house and brethren, our sisters, our father, our mother, our wife, our children, our lands, for my sake in the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands and persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. Are we dying to live? Are we willing to surrender all? How many know the hymn, all to Jesus I surrender? All to him I freely give. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. In his presence daily live. I surrender all. Is there anyone today who wants to surrender it all to Jesus?